The seven habits that destroy willpower. How your mind becomes conditioned for distraction and procrastination. Written and read by Anthony Manuel. That's me, by the way. Just a warning before we start. If you can't manage to focus long enough to listen all the way to the end of this recording, then you are almost certainly suffering from the afflictions of busted up brain circuitry that I'm going to outline in the following audio presentation. If your attention span is that far gone, at least watch the accompanying video that you are linked to. It'll be easier to take in this precious information, which just might save you from wasting your entire life on low value distractions that are hijacking your neurocircuitry. I'll be straight with you. Some of the stuff that I'm going to share with you here is downright terrifying. When I found out that I and seemingly everyone else around me had been conditioning our brains to be addicted to instant gratification, eviscerating the ability to focus on meaningful work, I felt like I was going to throw up. My life flashed before my eyes, but as an underwhelming montage of scenes where I was staring at memes on my phone, falling into a lethargic food coma by filling up on cheap pastries and honey Dijon flavored chips and nursing hangovers on the couch with an eternal loop of Netflix original series. Yes, damn it, I am still watching. Stop asking me. This isn't how I want to live my life, but it was how I was spending almost 90% of my time. I'm an artist, musician, writer, personal trainer, strength athlete, life coach. I have aspirations to build businesses that help multitudes of people, including you listening to this right now. I'm actually very good at all these things, and I enjoy them all tremendously. But instead of putting the effort to build, develop, and enjoy these aspects of my life that I'm supposedly passionate about, I used to spend hours procrastinating, wasting time on social media, smoking weed, watching YouTube videos until all hours of the night, and many, many more destructive, time-wasting, mind-destroying habits. The result is that I would always make a bit of progress on my goals, and then spiral into a self-loathing black hole of procrastination that would take a sledgehammer to anything I'd accomplished up to that point. I'm qualified to talk about this stuff not because I'm an expert behavioral neuroscientist who lives life with pristine, monk-like discipline. In fact, if you do have a scientific background, you might facepalm your way through the lack of precise terminology I use to illustrate my points. I'm qualified because I have one of the most addictive personalities on planet Earth, whose default state is a dumpster fire of hedonistic, self-destructive indulgence and laziness. Name a bad habit and I've been the poster child, which literally almost killed me on more than one occasion. I've had to fight tooth and nail to wrestle my addictive ADHD-like tendencies to the ground and figure out ways to work around it so that I could actually live the life I knew I had the potential to live. I spent years reading books, taking courses, working with coaches and more, trying to get a grip on my own compulsive behaviors. And I've also had the privilege of learning from hundreds of clients for whom my methods worked for as well. Whether it was coaching, nutrition, communication, business, or lifestyle habits, the principles always seem to apply. While the methods for getting my shit together worked, I had to reapply and refine them over and over because society is literally designed to keep us in a mindless compulsive state where our brains become hardwired to opt for convenient instant gratification over difficult tasks with delayed rewards. In this report, I'm going to share the seven most sinister offenders of conditioning that we're subject to, hidden in plain sight as normalized daily behaviors. If I hadn't recognized them and figured out how to mitigate the damage they caused, you definitely would not be reading this book or listening to the audio, because there's no way I'd be able to focus long enough to write it, record it, make the ad to get your attention, build the website to deliver it, and let's face it, we'd both still be looking at memes on our phones. Let's start at the beginning so you at least know what we're up against here. The dopamine dump that destroys your destiny. Imagine living your life in pre-civilized days for a moment. In order to survive, you would have to brave the elements, building fires and shelters to stay warm, dry, and comfortable. If you were hungry, you'd journey into the wilderness to hunt a wild animal that could kill you, or carefully forage plants that you hoped wouldn't poison you when you ate them. To protect yourself from predators, you would have to gather together in tribes, and you would need to be deeply aware of your position in the social hierarchy to maintain tribal acceptance, lest you get cast out and fight for your life against the harsh elements of nature on your own. Mating rights were gained through competence and competition. Reproduction was a hard-earned right that you were always trying to earn. In short, life was freaking hard. Everything related to survival, comfort, nourishment, or propagating the species required you to run a gauntlet akin to going through hell. Your brain needed something to motivate you to overcome these extremely uncomfortable trials, otherwise you simply would not put in the work to survive. 
The neurotransmitter dopamine did exactly that, giving your brain a good job, do more of that feeling every time you did something difficult and got to eat, earned social acceptance, had sex, or were warm and comfortable as a result. While there are many more neurochemicals involved in reward signaling and the neurochemistry of our behavior, for simplicity's sake, we're going to use dopamine as the star of our show and focus on how it motivates us. As the chemical signal of accomplishment, it was extremely useful for survival. To maximize energy efficiency, the brain learned to figure out how to get dopamine with less effort. For example, finding a tree with honey in it was a ton of calories for a lot less work than trying to kill, butcher, and cook an animal. Human beings evolved to want as much as we can get with the least amount of effort required to get it. This is basic survival economics. The more calories you can take in with the less calories spent acquiring them meant maximizing the energy that you had available to survive and reproduce. So what the heck does a caveman getting dopamine from hunting woolly mammoths have to do with why your brain is developing the attention span of an anxious, overly caffeinated squirrel? Well, while this dopamine reward circuit was extremely useful at motivating our ancestors to do difficult tasks to get rewards beneficial to survival, in the modern day developed world, not only is there an abundance of food, comforts, and conveniences that ensure our survival, we have hyper exaggerated, refined, concentrated, instantly delivered mega doses of it immediately available to us at all times. The problem is that your brain doesn't register the context in which dopamine is acquired. You might logically know that mucking down a triple cheeseburger with an extra large milkshake is gastric suicide and terrible for your arteries, but your brain just registers calories good, eat more. Over time, if we get used to these effortless hits of dopamine regularly, our brains become resistant to delayed gratification. It doesn't know that the reward will come later in the future, and it doesn't care. Subconsciously, it knows that there's an easier way to get a reward, so it will drive us towards the path of least resistance every time. Why bother taking the time to buy groceries and cook a good meal for myself when I can get just as many calories and more dopamine with way less effort from a bag of chips or a pizza delivery? Why bother putting myself through all the pain, rejection, anxiety, and stress of the dating world just to get a mate? I could get an infinite amount of sexual variety from dating apps and pornography without any of the emotional risk. Why the hell would I put work into engaging my community to build social status and a reputation when I can get immediate positive social feedback by posting some relatable meme on social media that gets a ton of reaction? Smoking weed and getting novel stimulation from watching Netflix takes no energy. But working on a new skill like learning an instrument or a new language or studying how to start my own business, that, that's a lot of focus and willpower. Guess which one I'm going to want to go for. Over time, your brain can become so resistant to doing tasks that delay gratification that even basic responsibilities cause it to act out like a spoiled toddler throwing a temper tantrum over not getting its lollipop. The result is an all-encompassing lethargy. The inability to move unless to return to whatever instant gratification task you were using to procrastinate with in the first place. Think of it this way. When someone spends most of their time stuffing their maw with Twinkies and Halloween candy, their bodies can't handle the unnaturally elevated blood sugar that their eating habits produce. Their pancreas starts pumping out massive amounts of insulin to deal with the excess glucose in their bloodstream. And over time, because their insulin levels are chronically elevated, their body becomes insulin resistant, as in the hormone is no longer able to perform its intended function. Type 2 diabetes is an exacerbated form of insulin resistance. The pancreas can't produce the amount of insulin needed to manage blood sugar because it needs more and more, and you eventually have to rely on exogenous insulin instead, monitoring your blood sugar levels at all times to make sure it doesn't get dangerous. The body is a finely tuned machine. An unnatural amount of a natural hormone can screw things up in a big way. Another example is a bodybuilder who injects steroids. One of the most common steroids for performance enhancement is testosterone, a very anabolic, as in muscle building, hormone produced principally in the testicles. So when someone starts taking massive amounts of testosterone through a needle, their body registers that they no longer need to produce this hormone themselves. So it shuts down its testosterone factory and our big strong bodybuilders balls shrink down to itty bitty shriveled raisins. So when we're taking 
in regular massive amounts of a neurotransmitter that was meant to be a reward for difficult tasks, replacing the healthy challenges that we're meant to go through as human beings with instant gratification. Over time, our bodies become desensitized to dopamine, and we require bigger, more regular hits with less and less effort. Our brains can become neurochemically resistant to hard work and delayed gratification because of our chronic exposure to easy hits of dopamine, so much that it ignores the suffering and unhappiness that these activities actually lead to just to get that hit. Addiction is wanting it more, but liking it less is a painfully true observation. Think of a drug addict whose life is being destroyed by the substances that he's abusing. The gambling addict who spends every last dollar that he has or can borrow from others on that next chance to hit 21 on the blackjack table. Or the person losing his marriage because he won't stop playing World of Warcraft. They'll go through an immense amount of suffering because they're desperate for that next hit of dopamine that they've conditioned their brains to need. It's not that different from the person who's scrolling Instagram and getting their hits of gratification from likes, comments, and memes instead of working out, reading, or building their passion project. There is good news in all this, though. We can actually do something about all of this. Change is possible. If a person with type 2 diabetes stops eating the way that caused their diabetes in the first place, with either a fasting protocol or a very low-carbohydrate diet that keeps their blood sugars and insulin levels very low, then they can actually reverse their diabetes, putting their insulin resistance in remission. If the bodybuilder who used exogenous testosterone doesn't use it for too long and cycles off of it in a strategic way, then he can coax his body back into natural testosterone production and his tiny little raisins will balloon back up into big old juicy grapes. All right, a little too far there. And yes, if you stop doing the things that bombard your brain with dumps of dopamine, then your reward pathways can become resensitized. After an initial period of immense boredom, you will suddenly find yourself inspired, energized, and motivated to tackle harder tasks, no longer sucking at the teat of your slave-driven instinct for instant gratification. You can actually reverse the mental conditions that create mental lethargy and procrastination by being the gatekeeper of habits and compulsions that turn you into a dopamine-dependent dummy. That's what this report is all about. The seven biggest offenders that are manipulating your brain and robbing you of creative potential, demolishing your ability to work hard and accomplish your goals, eroding your willpower, and essentially leaving you at the mere fraction of what you could be. Habit number one, wake and take a look at your phone. Every morning, we start with a blank slate, a fresh day that can be used to define our lives however we want. Mm, kind of. We like to imagine ourselves as the captains of our own ships, guiding, directing, and choosing every action that we take with intention and consciousness. The truth is a bit more like trying to steer a banana boat through a raging river rapid of external influences. Most of our behaviors are automatic, hardwired into us as habits so that we can be neurologically energy efficient as possible. The parts of our brain that are responsible for conscious, deliberate thoughts and actions are extremely calorie intensive, so we chunk and automate behaviors as much as we can to avoid burning ourselves out. The diminishment of our mind's energy reserves is so recognizable that it's an acknowledged psychological phenomenon called ego depletion. If you try to willpower your way through life, eventually you exhaust yourself and your brain will revert to whatever path of least resistant habit that it had previously hardwired. This is why at the end of a long, stressful workday, people who otherwise ate healthy and stuck to their positive habits will slump down on the couch in front of the TV while demolishing a full bag of chips. Their willpower reservoir has run dry after using it to manage challenging decisions or emotional situations all day at work. So when your alarm rudely jars you awake telling you that it's time to get out of your cozy blanket burrito, it's not the time to do a figure eight of opening and closing the same three social media apps on your phone for 20 minutes in bed. For one, you're starting your day saturating yourself with high dose instant dopamine. Phones are dopamine factories designed to put on that addictive light and vibration show that gets you hooked on white waiting for that next notification. If you start a meal with a double chocolate fudge cheesecake, the nuanced flavors of baked broccoli will be lost on you. The sugar bomb desensitizes your palate and makes everything else taste underwhelming in comparison. Likewise, immediately starting your day with low effort rewards makes difficult tasks with delayed gratification that much less palatable. 
Beyond that, exposing yourself to your smartphone first thing in the morning puts you in a highly reactive and emotional state. You have no idea what you're going to see when you open your messages, check your email inbox, what triggering news story might assault your news feed, what heart-wrenching pictures your ex is posting on Instagram, etc. Mornings are the prime time where willpower reserves are highest. You haven't endured a full day's worth of decisions and stressors, and it's the optimal window to take advantage of your unimpeded focus for the most difficult times of the day. It's not the time of the day to inundate yourself with the oh-so-important internet happenings like the latest scoop on Kylie Jenner's favorite restaurant or the opinion piece the racist aunt wrote about Donald Trump's impeachment being a conspiracy theory to undermine democracy. How we start our mornings sets the tone for the rest of the day. If we begin with a barrage of random stimuli creating unpredictable emotional spikes, it's going to immediately deplete us of our precious limited willpower, making us susceptible to the influences of our environment. If we want to be the captains of our own ship, we should start our days by sailing into smoother waters, not the choppy waves of jarring digital media. The more that we can begin our days from an internal reference point where we choose our own emotional states, act with intention, and don't surrender our focus to a random number generator of content pouring out of our tiny pocket computers, the more in control our lives we will be. Habit number two, zucking on social media constantly. Social media is one of the most incredible innovations that's ever been invented for the purposes of networking, connecting with loved ones around the world, cataloging moments and memories, building and marketing businesses, and giving artists, writers, and anyone with a message a platform. It's also the biggest shit show of human ignorance, empty minded distraction, and dopamine dousing clusterfuckery that you could possibly expose yourself to. That buzzing in our pocket becomes a dominating force that compels us to pull out our phones to get that sweet, sweet hit of gratification from a new notification to the point where we don't even wait for the beep anymore. We just pull out our phones and refresh the page over and over, hoping something new will happen. In the same way that the flashing lights and thrilling uncertainty of a slot machine can have someone feeding it their hard-earned money for hours, the novelty of a never-ending news feed and the disruptive delights of a new notification are designed to short-circuit our brains and capture our attention for as long as possible. Don't believe me? Even Facebook's ex-president Sean Parker shared that it's all by design. Because receiving a like or a comment on your post gives you a little hit of dopamine, It's a social validation feedback loop, exactly the kind of thing that a hacker like myself would come up with, because you're exploiting a vulnerability in human psychology. Yeah, he said that during an interview, where he talked about the unintended consequences of the technology they developed. However, quote, the inventors, creators understood this consciously, and we did it anyway. If big tech is starting to sound more and more like a Bond villain nefariously plotting mass mind control, you wouldn't be that far off. Except rather than world domination, their main motive is profit. Platforms like Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram are businesses that make their money through targeted advertising, meaning they collect your data and then sell it to companies that specifically want to target you based on your age, geographical location, interests, and relevant internet browsing behavior. You're likely listening to this audiobook as a result of targeted advertising. You're the exact person that I wanted to help with this information. I found you specifically through the targeting demographics I used in my ad campaign. The system works. Good marketers understand this about human psychology and they use it to their advantage. Remember in the Avengers when Thanos wanted to get rid of the Infinity Stones, the ultimate power in the universe, so he used the stones to destroy the stones? In a similar way, I'm trying to use this compulsive glitch in human psychology to free people from their compulsions. Since these social media companies make their money through a free app that sells advertisement, in order to maximize profitability, they would want to maximize time spent looking at the app, time spent engaging with certain content on the app, time spent posting on the app, time spent colluding with other users with similar interests, all of which maximizes data collected to optimize how ads target you, increasing your likelihood you'll click them, thus making the company more money. As a business, the goal is to keep you on the app engaging with the content as long as possible to increase exposure to increasingly tailored ads. Everything from the speed at which you can scroll to how notifications show up on your phone, to how often certain friends 
content shows up to how your newsfeed would literally never end if you were to scroll for eternity is specifically designed, A-B tested, to keep you coming back for more again and again for that constant IV drip of gratification. What's more concerning is that human beings tend towards the negativity bias, meaning that negative thoughts, events, and situations will have a far greater impact on our psychological process than neutral or positive ones. Since the algorithms are geared to deliver you content similar to what you engage with, and human beings have a higher psychological tendency to engage with negative content, I mean, just look at the hours strangers will spend arguing with each other in the comment sections, you can get caught in a loop of negative and anxiety-inducing content that keeps you highly reactive and hooked on these unpleasant emotional spikes. Yes, these companies design their apps to capitalize on your psychological vulnerabilities and dominate your attention. One of the most useful tools for communication and creativity turns you into a tool for profit by putting you in a state of distracted, half-dazed, emotional consumerism. I'm not saying these apps are inherently evil. I'm just saying... You're a human being, and you're likely subject to the meticulous designed pitfalls of technological mind control. If you're on social media all the time throughout the day and you're getting consistent hits of dopamine every time you open the app and see something new, your brain is going to want to keep going back over and over again instead of doing literally anything else that requires effort or creativity. Deliberate and intentional uses of social media is a powerful way to connect, network with people who have relevant interests, organize business affairs, stay in touch with friends overseas, and more. But keep in mind that there's always going to be a flashing slot machine of likes, comments, memes, emotionally spiking news articles, and funny cat videos pulling you in with its attention-commanding tendrils. Use with caution, and be alert of the commercial intent to command your most precious resources, your time and your attention. Habit number three, getting bit by your sweet tooth. A study was done with rats where an electrode was implanted deep in the pleasure centers of their brain, and that electrode was then hooked up to a button to activate it. The rats would go press the button 2,000 times a day for 24 hours straight, ignoring their hunger, thirst, and even other female rats in heat. Food, hydration, and sex were all foregone for the instant gratification of the pleasure button, and the rats had to be unhooked from the electrode to prevent them from literally starving to death. Subsequent experiments took rats hooked up to the pleasure button and put an electrified panel that would deliver a painful shock between them and the button. When put between the rats and food, the rats refused to walk across the electric panel, avoiding the pain even if it meant starving. The rats that were hooked up to the pleasure lever, however, endured being electrocuted just so that they could get that sweet, sweet hit of the electric feel-good reward of mashing that button. Once we're hooked on a certain type of pleasure and reward, we'll literally do things that we understand are harmful or painful in order to get the gratification we crave. When I was 15, I weighed over 285 pounds, or 129 kilograms for anyone outside of North America. My main addictions were video games, MSN Messenger, and as much hyper-palatable food as I could stuff down my maw before feeling physically ill. Like a cigarette smoker who knows he's giving himself lung cancer, I continued to cram down half a grocery store aisle's worth of cereal every week, as well as any other sugar-laden food I could get my hands on, despite it making me fat and sick. If there's one thing that you want to do to royally fuck up your brain, it's eat a ton of sugar. The links to refined sugar's effects on the brain are manifold. Impaired memory, slowed cognitive function, attention deficit, inflammation, causative factors for depression and unstable mood, damaged hunger signaling, and yes, it negatively affects your reward centers and dopamine signaling. In fact, Studies have shown that eating a lot of sugar over a long period of time can actually affect the gene expression for dopamine receptivity and availability. Yep, mucking down too many chocos and gummy worms can alter your DNA to be more hooked on sweets and have a natural predisposition for instant gratification. One study published in 2013 called Sugar Addiction, Pushing the Drug-Sugar Analogy to the Limit, stated that this research has revealed that sugar and sweet reward can not only substitute to addictive drugs like cocaine, but can even be more rewarding and attractive. At the neurobiological level, the neural substrates of sugar and sweet rewards appear to be more robust than those of cocaine, i.e. 
more resistant to functional failures, possibly reflecting past selective evolutionary pressures for seeking and taking foods high in sugar and calories. Everyone knows that eating sugar isn't good for your health. Like everyone knows that, right? I'm not, I'm not crazy. I'm not making an unreasonable assumption here, but everyone also loves ice cream, chocolate, or some other vehicle to deliver that hit of refined sugar. We know that it's bad for our teeth, but we'll have the sugar crash after the initial high and we'll crave more of it and likely overeat, but mm, those powdered donuts are so good. We'll walk across the electric panel of health consequences to hit the pleasure button of our favorite sweet treat every time. I'm no longer a serial killing fat kid, but a hundred pounds lighter at my heaviest weight, I seldom eat processed foods with sugar in them. I'm also human. When my mom sends me homemade treats at Christmas, I'm probably going to eat the whole batch in a matter of days. Or realistically, like one day. I'm just going to be honest with you. Its pull is powerful, and it's not through willpower that I resist the confectionary allures of sugar. Eating sugar has some serious, immediate, and long-term health consequences. But if 95% of the time you're eating in a way that supports cognitive function, healthy metabolism, eating the odd Tim Tam isn't going to kill you. The bit of sugar in your ketchup isn't going to turn you into a dopamine-dependent junkie itching for their next fix of hind-drenched potatoes. If you have a habit of regularly pounding down the sweets though, maybe you should check yourself. A chocolate chip muffin for breakfast, a chocolate bar with lunch and dessert every night with dinner is a sign that you're slowly or not so slowly eroding your brain's potential for focus, mood, stability, and motivation. Curb your inner cake lever and watch the sugar. Habit number four, booze and bud binges, alcohol and weed. I'm so, so sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Alcohol has always been the funniest idea to me as a social convention. It's completely accepted to give ourselves a liquid lobotomy that makes us do incredibly stupid things while simultaneously acknowledging that we're poisoning our bodies and we'll have to feel like a useless pile of garbage the next day while our liver works overtime to reverse the damage. In terms of our star neurotransmitter, Alcohol has a pronounced effect on their release of dopamine, but the real damage that alcohol can do to you is erode your inhibitions and willpower, meaning that a few drinks out with the homies cascades into a debaucherous circus of bad behaviors. How many times has a quote-unquote friend of yours, wink wink, had a night on the town that ends in the indulgence of party drugs you never intended to do, a few cigarettes that you quote only smoke when you drink, eventually capping off the evening with a 3 a.m. pizza party? You might go out for just one drink and wake up with a half-eaten burger and fast food wrappers littered around your bed. Or there might be a total stranger or two tangled up in those same blankets. Alcohol in itself has some atrocious effects on your health. I mean, it's literally poison that creates altered states of consciousness from fighting to metabolize it and clear it from your body. But the decisions that you make after consuming alcohol can be even more damaging. Again, I'm human and context is everything. As weird as it seems when you say it out loud, drinking is actually a part of society, and there is actually something fun about shutting off certain parts of our brain with half a bottle of red wine with dinner or some nice whiskey with your friends. Some of the best and most memorable nights I've had have involved alcohol, albeit they're a little harder to remember for the same reason. I drink a few times per year. The habit that I'm talking about doing major damage is when it's a few times per week or daily which I also used to do and saw firsthand how much of a mess it can turn your life into. I lumped weed in here for the same reason. While diehard potheads will say that marijuana isn't habit forming, I've had friends throw every joint, pipe, bong, and flush their stash down the toilet as a declarative act of quitting completely, only to go out and buy it all again the next day and smoke themselves silly, often repeating this same cycle several times per week. I mean, I say I've had friends that do that, but I've also been that person myself, having been a chronic pothead for years. The psychoactive chemical in marijuana, THC, dumps an inordinate amount of dopamine in your brain, and the feeling of being high comes from your reward centers being blasted on overdrive. The idea that it wouldn't be habit-forming is absolutely asinine. The whole reason it's enjoyable in the first place is it because it gives us a hit of instant gratification on the most fundamental chemical level. Like my example with alcohol though, having a habit, emphasis on habit, 
of smoking weed comes with a host of stacked on challenges that erode your willpower. When you use it, it's working on your entire endocannabinoid system, which affects your appetite and your emotions. I can't believe that I'm explaining that smoking weed gives you munchies, but I mean, <laughs> here we are. Smoking that joint makes you more susceptible to a full-on snack fest. When you're high, the parts of your brain that signal satiety shut down completely, giving you an almost endless appetite, and even seeing food will signal your dopamine craving reward system more than usual. You're more likely to opt for the hyperpalatable, highly dopaminergic foods, and this is purely speculative and observed from personal experience, your limited reserves of willpower are functionally drained when you're high, leading to more automatic, pleasure-driven behaviors. Yes, it's fun to get stoned and play guitar, or take an edible and meditate. Having a little hoot with your buddies on the beach or before you go to the movie theater can add an extra dimension to the already great experiences you're having. But like anything that you take exogenously over and over again, you'll eventually develop tolerance to it. And since marijuana is so dopaminergic, regular use with gradually increased doses is going to put your reward system out of whack. Habit number five, giving yourself a hand with internet pornography. One of the most bizarre subcultures born of the internet age is the NoFap movement. Men everywhere realize that their evolved hunter-gatherer brains weren't well adapted to handle the sheer amount of sexual novelty from the infinite catalog of pornography in the internet, and saw how much porn addiction had become rampant. It ravaged their lives, robbed them of motivation, and caused them so much desensitization to sexual imagery that it even resulted in erectile dysfunction with actual sexual partners. How the hell was this happening? In all mammals, there is a phenomenon called the Coolidge Effect. With repeated exposure to the same sexual partner, interest in arousal begins to decline. Arousal and vigor becomes renewed in the presence of a new partner who they haven't been exposed to before, giving us a predisposition for multiple sexual partners. This was evolutionarily beneficial because it promoted genetic variety in offspring, encouraging the survival of the species with many positive genetic trait combinations. It's present in both men and women and is very primitive, fundamental, instinctual. We're all subject to it. This makes monogamy a very interesting social institution for human beings whose primitive brains are wired to crave and seek out sexual diversification. It might explain the increased prominence in polyamory and give more insight into why people who are in seemingly happy partnerships end up cheating anyway. There's literally a chemical circuit bribing them into infidelity. Pornography is the Coolidge effect on hyperdrive, exposing you to an array of sexual variety with unending men, women, positions, situations, and kinks available at your fingertips. In order to meet the increasing resistance to sexual stimulation you experience from the immense diversity of porn available, you have to increase the obscurity or kinkiness of the imagery that you expose yourself to. Yes, sexual gratification is extremely dopaminergic in nature. It was essential to give reproduction a huge reward signal to motivate the survival of the species. With porn, you rapidly become desensitized to the stimulation and can only become aroused, i.e. get a motivating dopamine response, with increasingly hardcore stimulation. When the only way that you can get aroused involves grabbing yourself with a vice grip or blasting yourself with a jackhammer strength vibrator while watching scenes with 12 or more people, a whole lot of leather whips and chains, a kiddie pool full of jello and props that look like medieval torture devices, then the sweet, soft, sensual touch of a loving partner probably won't do much to get you turned on. If dopamine desensitization and shrinking genitals doesn't scare you away from internet pornography, then maybe a shrinking brain will. A study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association showed that the hours of pornography you watch are proportionately correlated to a decrease in gray matter. This is terrifying! Causing dysfunctions in both heads is a terrible trade-off for a quick porn-powered wank. Seeing how damaging this was to the male psyche, the no-fat movement emerged and hundreds of men reported gaining superpowers of motivation, libido, charisma, confidence, and focus after longer terms of abstaining from pornography and masturbation. 
Again, like in the instance of the diabetic reversing their conditions by abstaining from carbohydrate and becoming insulin sensitive again, these men fasted from the thing that caused their sexual dysfunction and regained their virility and sensitivity to sexual arousal. Dating can be an awkward, painful, ego-busting, heart-wrenching world to navigate. It requires some of the deepest forms of personal development you can do, which is relating yourself to another person. It is a lot of work. It is high risk in many ways. Our primitive brains still fear rejection from the tribe as a death sentence, so in some ways, putting yourself out there for a mate can literally feel like a life or death situation. But if you forego the challenge of diving into the dating pool in favor of an endless sea of porn, you'll be sacrificing much more than the pain of possible rejection. Just ditch the porn and reclaim your sexuality and your mind. Habit number six, the cinematic experience that knows you better than you do. In the book, Big Data in Practice by Bernard Marr, he discusses how Netflix is said to account for one third of peak time internet traffic in the US, with 65 million members in over 50 countries consuming more than 100 million hours of movies and binge watch series per day. The biggest job departments at Netflix are dedicated to analytics to optimize personalized user recommendations. Starting back in 2006, the company launched the Netflix Prize, a pot worth $1 million offered to the group that could develop the best predictive algorithm to suggest new movies based on customers' previous ratings. The winning group's algorithm is still used as the core of the service software, updated and added as the company evolves. When it comes to making any predictive algorithm more precise, the more data points you have to work with, the better. They begin adding hyper-specific element tags to its contents, things like rom-com with a middle-aged lead who has a quirky boss and owns a cute dog. These sub-tags led to Netflix defining nearly 80,000 new micro-genres of movies based on their customers' viewing habits. By amassing a wealth of immensely distinct individual viewer data, when Netflix went to position themselves as a content creator with original series and movies, they were able to reverse engineer exactly what their customers wanted to see in a show. Every element of the production, including the colors used on the cover images, were informed by data on what their users liked most. If Netflix can optimize putting exactly what you want to see in front of your eyes at exactly the times you're most likely to watch it, what else can they optimize? One example is the autoplay feature that will continually stream the next episode until you've finished the entire season, and the six hours that you just spent on your couch has left a permanent imprint of your ass. YouTube is also notorious for this, combining autoplay features with recommended content that you're highly likely to watch and enjoy, based on their algorithm. One of the biggest lies you can tell yourself is, oh, I'll just watch one quick episode and then get to work. One of the fascinating things about watching TV is that it changes the state that your brain is in. When you're watching a show or a film, your brain switches to a more passive mode, producing more alpha brain waves, which are associated with daydreaming and less critical analysis. You're more likely to be emotional than rational in this state. So when you become invested in whatever show you're watching, you will absolutely not tolerate a cliffhanger. This passive state also vies for the path of least resistance, so you're less likely to manually intervene in the automatic playback of the next episode or suggested movie. Before you know it, your brain has been tricked into an endless loop of effortless entertainment as you spend hours passively absorbing custom-tailored content. Again, I'm not staying completely abstained from Netflix, YouTube, or movies. Hell, uh, earlier in this audiobook, I made an Avengers reference, which I happen to have rewatched recently on Netflix. Some of the content that I have learned in this ebook was sparked from information that I found in YouTube videos. What I am saying is that when you're using a streaming service that's designed to deliver you hours of content that you would specifically enjoy, that it's easy to drain away hours of your precious limited time and procrastinate like crazy. Make sure that you're more aware of yourself and your tendencies than a streaming service algorithm is. Habit number seven the blue light sleep killer. You'll probably notice that the vast majority of the habits on this list have something in common. They're all sources of compulsive behaviors originating from a glowing screen, either from a phone or a computer. If you're hooked into unconsciously staring at your screen for hours, you'll forego other important needs that are beneficial to your health, in this case, sleep. 
Our bodies evolved to rise with the sun and sleep as it sets, producing a natural hormonal and neurochemical wave called our circadian rhythm. It's largely dictated by the spectrums of light that we're exposed to, with daylight in a spectrum called blue light. This is the same spectrum of light that our phones and computers emit, meaning that when we're compulsively glued to our screens in the evening, we're exposing ourselves to blue light at a time when we shouldn't be, confusing our natural systems and disrupting our circadian rhythm. The result is that we don't produce the right neurotransmitters to signal relaxation and deep sleep. Sleep quality is compromised as a result. In more extreme cases, you end up fighting the urge to drift off so that you can watch that one more episode, scroll another meme, get another notification, or otherwise mindlessly sacrifice your sleep altogether on the altar of digital entertainment. You will literally procrastinate on falling asleep, which you'd think wasn't possible, but yet here we are in our beds at 3 a.m. holding our phones precariously over our heads until our arm goes numb, using the touchscreen like a treadmill for our thumbs. If you're habitually getting crappy sleep, you're eating into the willpower, focus, and energy of the next day. Sleep when you're dead is the dumbest advice for anyone who wants to be productive, attendant, and effective at anything in their lives. Sleep deprivation can cause a tendency towards overeating and increased appetite, decreases working memory, it increases cortisol, which is a stress hormone that can really jack you up, diminishes the innovative thinking and flexible decision-making capacities that you have, it lowers your immune function in many ways, making you way more likely to get sick. In other words, all of the potentially bad habits or setbacks that you're likely to fall back on will create a feedback loop of time wasting overeating mental fog and feeling like garbage just by not getting enough sleep. Honestly, I don't need to list a bunch of peer-reviewed medical studies to tell you that missing out on sleep makes you feel like crap. We've all had those days where we didn't get enough rest, get a little mentally sloppy, snap at our loved ones, binge on snacks, and want to do nothing but collapse in a blanket-wrapped heap watching reruns of our favorite shows. A combination of circadian rhythm disrupting blue light, emotional spikes from shows and social media content, and the addictive nature of non-stop dopamine hits will keep you awake for hours, making the quality of sleep that you do get absolutely trash. So if you want to make everything worse, making it way more likely to fall back on other crappy habits that waste your life away, then by all means, stare at blue light screens for all hours of the night instead of sleeping and recharging for the next day. It'll guarantee that you consistently operate at a fraction of your potential of a human being. If you want to get to the top of your game, just turn off the screens and get your ass to sleep. So what's the real problem with all these problems? By now, You've listened to all seven of the habits, and you might be thinking, holy hell, i got to get a handle on this distracted days I've been in. You might not know exactly how. Maybe you're already cognizant of how jacked up you've gotten from some of these bad habits, yet despite the awareness that you're being hurt by their effects, you don't quite know how to quit. My joke was that I was enlightened on Monday and then the same jackass scrolling meme accounts for hours in bed on Tuesday. I'd be gung-ho, see a little progress here and there, and then back to my merry old way. Many clients confess that this was one of their biggest reasons that they hired me as a coach. They were hoping that the accountability factor would actually get them to stick to the changes that they were trying to make. The issue with trying to stop bad habits is that most people don't have a good framework for behavioral change. They'll try to willpower they, their way through only to run into ego depletion and fall back on and typically overindulge in the very activities that they were trying to remove from their lives. Dopamine desensitization can be so strong that unconscious urges for instant gratification will sabotage any effort to change. One of the biggest frustrations in the world is knowing that you know what you have to do to improve, but you're going to quickly return to the old patterns when you try to. This is why diets fail, why addicts have relapses, why you still procrastinate, despite knowing that there's more that you could be getting out of life if you just did the damn work. There's no system to create lasting change in place in any of these instances, and if there is, it's unrealistic and doesn't take into account our neurochemistry and our subconscious motivations. You'll ping pong back and forth between a bit of progress and a bit of regression, a bit of progress, a bit of regression over and over and over like a yo-yo diet or losing the same 20 pounds over and over again. The effects that this loop can have on your self-confidence can be catastrophic. You can start to feel like a failure, like you'll never break through to the other side, and it can be a really depressing reality to concede that your compulsions might just run your life, that you might always be stuck in this dissatisfied, mediocre existence. 
This was the exact pain that drove me to try and find a real solution for lasting change, a way to really overcome compulsive, mindless, distractive, ADHD, procrastinating habits, develop a rock solid ability to focus and actually make lasting change without falling back on your old patterns. Real permanent transformation, a system to take action on the steps that will get you closer to self-actualization. I use the same principles to lose 100 pounds and reach other fitness goals, to go from ADHD and unable to focus on a single paragraph to being able to read over 80 books per year, to stop spending up to eight hours a day browsing social media and YouTube, to cultivating the focus and execution to build a coaching business and actually help people. I learned that willpower isn't enough, good intentions aren't enough. Even accountability sometimes isn't enough. Knowing the things that you're supposed to do isn't enough because there's the roadblock of working around your mind, your subconscious, to actually getting it done. Learning to grasp the nuances of your psychology and building systems around it, understanding what feedback you need to pay attention to, tracking your results in the right way, and cultivating more intricate self-awareness, these are all instrumental factors in creating real lasting change that will override your primitive brain and compulsive instincts. I wanted to help people on this journey of making meaningful change in their behaviors and life without falling back to their old behaviors only a week later. I didn't want the results that people got to be temporary. I'd been through that frustrating pattern more times than I can count, and I don't want other people to be stuck in that painful cycle without realizing how they can change it. I genuinely hope that you have some sort of spark of curiosity and you're investigating your self-awareness in a deeper way. My wish for you is to live a more conscious, intentional, authentic life where you're able to express yourself, build and develop the things that you're most passionate about, and don't let your life pass you by. I hope that you investigate and take responsibility for living less in distraction and more with purpose. I hope that you learn to enjoy focusing profusely on the things that are most important to you and that you set free your mind from the grips of habitual instant gratification to experience the joys of true depth in life. I hope you enjoyed this audiobook. I really enjoyed writing it and producing it for you. See you on the other side, guys.